I'm Rebecca Lewington. Welcome to our podcast. I'm here with Tim Hollis from Micron's Technology and Products Group. He's a signal integrity expert and one of the inventors of Micron's new and unusual GDDR6X graphics memory technology. He's also a Micron Fellow, which means that he's recognized inside and outside Micron as a technical expert and innovator in his field. When Tim speaks, people listen. He also lost count of his patents once it got past 150. Tim, thanks very much for joining me. Thank you, Rebecca. Appreciate it. So first, tell us a bit about yourself. What's your role at Micron and what's your background? Sure. Well, I joined Micron right out of graduate school. I was hired into a group called the Advanced Architecture Team. And um, my role in that group was really to help with uh, high-speed uh, related items, so high-speed I.O. Uh, circuit design, and then some signal integrity support, uh, which, well, and essentially I was a circuit designer at that point. Um, later on in my career, about halfway through, I actually transitioned over to Micron's signal integrity team, and that's where I reside now, and my role is really to... Uh, is pathfinding. It's it's how are we going to go faster at lower power in the future? That's that's my job. Got it. And what does signal, signal integrity actually mean? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, if you think back to say uh, undergraduate class, the first time you have a you're you're using your schematic capture tool and you have a you know two circuit blocks, you got to have them talk to each other. In those tools, you just draw a line and it doesn't matter how long the line is or if it wraps all around your screen, it makes a perfect connection. But the reality of it is that we have to make those connections with real wires. So whether that's on a chip or between two chips, uh, signal integrity is all about if we launch information, can we capture it at the other end properly with high reliability? And that's becoming more and more difficult as we go to higher frequencies. Those those wires are less and less ideal at higher frequencies. So if it's not a wire, what does it look like in your world? Uh, well, it could be a, you know, a trace on a printed circuit board. Um, but, you know, where we have the most challenges are, you know, moving between layers on a board. Some of these boards are, you know, several layers thick. And, and uh, the, the connection itself could be the trace. It could be a via between two layers. It could be a... Um, one of the balls at the bottom of our package where our package connects onto a printed circuit board. All these things really lay in the path of the signal and make up that channel. It's clearly a tough life being an electrical signal in the modern world. So <laughs> GDR6X, it's a bit of a mouthful. What does all of that mean? Sure. Well, the six is just that this is the sixth generation of GDDR. Uh, the X is really that it's an extension of GDDR6. And to understand that, it's helpful to, to talk a little bit of history and look at um, what GDDR5X was. Um, in the GDDR5 timeframe, which was maybe more than 15 years ago when we started talking about GDDR5, we were targeting initially about five gigabits per second. Uh, that sounded really fast at the time for memory. And by the time it came out, it was targeting six. And then over time, it's, that's evolved all the way to eight gigabits per second. At eight gigabits per second, it was it seemed almost insurmountable. How would we double that bandwidth and create another generation? And so behind the scenes, Micron and one of our industry partners looked at ways we could change the memory and the interface in order to open the way for another doubling of the bandwidth. And that kind of intermediate product was GDDR5X. That led to GDDR6 that we have now. And now we have the same kind of challenge, right? GDDR6 is at 16 gigabits per second. How do we get to 32? And so we did the same thing with the same industry partner. Um, we co-developed a solution that would allow us to get to 32 gigabits per second eventually uh, and, and open that path. And that's GDDR6X. That's, this is a parallel interface. So that's 32 gigabits per second per wire. How many that's wires correct. are there? What does that add up to? Uh, what does it add up to? Yeah. Well, uh, terabytes per second, I think. I don't have that's the right a, number. That's I mean, a, a big lot. number. Yeah, I mean, I kind of worry about the pin level and, you know, there are system architects that worry about uh, when you add them all up and you get your... But, but wait, those two, wire, those two traces are next to each other on the circuit board. Well, there are a bunch of traces next to each other. So how can they not be your problem? Well, they could be a problem for sure. And, and obviously, as we go faster, 
there's more energy coupled between those two traces. So th these are some of the challenges that have to be uh, addressed. That and the, the losses of the channel, all, any kind of impairment on the channel itself is a, is a problem for signal integrity. And what's special about graphics memory as opposed to regular memory? Sure. Uh, well, DDR, you know, began back in about 2000 and almost immediately diverged. Um, there was a need for a higher bandwidth solution than the traditional DDR, and that's where graphics DDR came from. So GDDR was the, the higher bandwidth solution, and then shortly after, we needed a more low-power solution for mobile applications, and that was the LPDDR. So you've got kind of these three branches of the DDR family, and we could say that the GDDR is really the hot rod of the family. It's, the, um, it's all about bandwidth. And so some trade-offs are conceded in order to enable that bandwidth. Right, you can't have high bandwidth and low power simultaneously. Right, it's tough. Right. Now, I gather that GDDR6X is a bit special. It's not just, you haven't just turned up the knob on GDDR6, you've done something different. Can you tell us something about the special source? Sure, yeah. Uh, turning up the knob is generally not the most power efficient way to move forward. And as I mentioned, um, you know, sitting at about 16 gigabits per second with GDDR6 and looking out to 32 uh, really seemed um, incredibly difficult. And so we had to find a solution that would allow us to get there without actually increasing our frequency. And one of the ways you can do that is with multi-level signaling. And, and we've been tinkering around with multi-level signaling since about 2007 but more in earnest about 2015, as we saw GDDR6 might be the end of life for GDDR, and we, we didn't want you know, things to end there. So um, we saw this as an opportunity, finally, to bring multi-level signaling into the memory interface. And we've adopted what's called four-level pulse amplitude modulation for PAM4, and that simply allows us to move two bits with every cycle, so we get double the bandwidth with uh, at the same operating frequency. So you're not putting ones and zeros down a wire anymore. You're putting threes and twos and ones and zeros down Correct. a wire. Correct, yep. I mean, they're still all just analog voltage levels. So instead of having you know something that represented a one and something that represented a zero, we've got four uniform levels um, sitting there between that one and zero, basically. So that's pretty easy to explain, but what were some of the challenges in actually making it happen? Because this has never been done before. Sure. Not in memory uh, anyway. Yeah, sure. Well, and that's a good point. I mean, PAM4 isn't uh, novel, right? It's been around for a long time, and it really is the backbone of some of our highest speed communication systems in the world presently. Uh, the difference is in the DRAM world, um, as we're so focused on maximizing bandwidth per pin, we couldn't adopt the traditional differential PAM4 solution where you send a true and complement uh, value on two different pins. So we're sending true those four levels across. What yeah. does true and complement mean? Well, true and complement would mean I send a one. If I had to send a one, I have to send a zero on the neighboring signal and at the other end of the channel, the receiver compares those two incoming signals and says, all right, you know, one minus zero is one and that's, that's my answer. Uh, and PAM4 has tended to you know, follow that same differential approach where every signal is transmitted over two wires. In our case, we're sending those same four bits or the same two bits um, or four levels over one wire. Uh, and, and so that's, uh, we call that single-ended signaling. And, and that really does uh, ramp up the challenge. Um, so anytime you, you take, uh, for example, your zero and your one voltage levels and divide that into four uniform levels, you've uh, reduced your signal to noise ratio substantially. So you become much more sensitive to any kind of, uh, any kind of noise in the system, like the two neighboring wires you mentioned earlier, right. were three mm -hmm. times as sensitive to something like that. So your, your job as an electron shepherd just got more complicated because of That's that. That's true. Yeah. And you sure. can't do two wires for each channel because then you'd have four times as many wires and you'd end up exactly restarted. That's right. In fact, GDDR6X is in the same uh, exact package form factor that GDDR6 is. We did make some modifications to the uh, locations of the, the pins at the bottom of the package, but otherwise it looks just like a GDDR6. We didn't add pins to get more bandwidth. 
Now, does this add challenges to what this device plugs into? Well, yeah, what it does is it, it transitions the burden from trying to double the speed on chip to doubling the speed across the channel, which means that that interface has to be designed much more carefully. And, and GDDR6 was already a high speed solution, uh, which required really careful channel design. GDDR6X requires even more care. So upshot, you've got twice as much data for the same clock speed and less power per bit? Less power per bit, yep. Wow, it's a win-win-win. It's a win, win, win. It is. It's awesome. a win-win-win. Yeah. So just to, just to finish this conversation off, sure. um, you're a fellow at Micron and there aren't very many of those and it's quite an achievement to become a fellow. Um, what, is it, what does being a fellow mean to you? What, is it, what does it make you do? What does it make you do? Well, um, it's a real honor to be a fellow. I mean, it means that uh, for one, I get to represent Micron uh, in, in different ways. Um, it means I have a responsibility to mentor the rising generation of engineers within the company and even as I go out and have opportunity to speak at universities. Um, it also means that I get to, my voice is heard in certain, you know, strategic decisions, which, which for me is, is terrific. I love being a part of that. Excellent. And you've been at Micron for some time. And you've... Yeah, I joined Micron in 2006. And being, being part of this career path, you're, you can stay on a technical track without becoming a manager. And that's I, right. I guess that's something that allows you to still be an inventor, but as you say, have your voice heard. Yeah, it's, uh, it's terrific. No one reports to me, but um, I do have a lot of people that I work with every day and, and it's great. But I, I get to focus on identifying uh, the challenges of the future and trying to work towards solutions. Excellent. <laughs> Well, congratulations on seeing this idea come to life. And I can't wait to see what's next. All right. Hey, thank you, Rebecca. That's great. Thank you for your time.